People who grew up in uh, Southern California in the 1980s and uh, who went to evangelical churches are likely to remember um, an interesting uh, music scene that developed in Southern California uh, during the 1980s. And it, and it continues, uh, I suppose, to this day, but I think most people who grew up in California in the 80s would recognize that decade as, as kind of a golden age of a certain music scene that developed in Southern California. And uh, I was one of those people who grew up in Southern California at that time and, um, and participated in this scene. Uh, I was in a band, but mostly as a, you know, as a person who went to concerts. And now I'm a history teacher. And um, I've thought a lot about that music scene uh, in the 80s in Southern California. And I've wondered you know, where it came from and, and uh, why it was the way it was. So I thought uh, as a history teacher, I would, uh, I'd put this presentation together and just offer some thoughts. And um, uh, maybe those who, uh, who grew up in Southern California and uh, participated in this alternative Christian music scene, um, maybe they'll have different ideas about what that was all about. Uh, but here are, here are some of mine. So there were a lot of bands that came around in Southern California. Um, at that time, one of them would be the Altar Boys, another called the Choir, another called Adam Again. There are a lot of, a lot of other bands. I think these are some of, the, some of the better known bands. I think most people would agree that probably the most important band in Southern California in the alternative Christian music scene was Undercover. And that's the, that's the band that I'll, I'll talk about here. And uh, just show you some of their uh, albums. They have more albums than the ones I'll show you, but these are the ones that, that I most remember. Uh, I left Southern California uh, in 1993, um, was a full-time student and then a graduate student, and so I sort of lost touch with, uh, with what was going on. But these are uh, some of Undercover's early albums, and they'd very much be classed as, I think, New Wave, uh, Christian music, but of the new wave genre. Uh, that holds for this album as well, uh, Boys and Girls Renounce the World. And then when you get to their next album, Branded 1986, I'm not sure that it would be classed as new wave any longer. Uh, it's more of a, a, a rock uh, kind of feel. I'm not sure exactly what genre it would be, but certainly it's, it's, it's heavier and darker in every respect than, than the previous albums. And that holds true uh, for this album, uh, Balance of Power. Now there are other undercover albums that, that follow this, and then there's a live album, which I haven't mentioned, but, but that's just, a, you know, just an overview of, of uh, uh, the key records that came out in, uh, in that period from the early 80s to 1990. And so where did this Christian alternative music scene come from? Um, well, there's a context, there's a national context, and we'll just say a little bit about that. Of course, the 80s, so we associate with the presidency of Ronald Reagan. You can see in these two maps here uh, that Ronald Reagan won two uh, presidential elections decisively, and that signaled a certain conservative shift in presidential politics. I don't know that it really signaled a conservative shift in popular culture. I don't think that's true. But in terms of presidential politics, uh, there was a conservative shift in the 80s. Also, very importantly in the 80s, important for young people like me, um, was the beginning of MTV, which when it started did nothing but showed music videos. And that held uh, for a while, MV M MTV now is obviously very different, but when it began, it was music television. And so you would just watch one, uh, you could watch one video after another. And the reason this is important is because this was the first time that, that um, young people could regularly see uh, the bands that they liked uh, because you have constant access to these music videos that are just being played 24 hours a day. So that's part of the context. The music style, um, I think beginning in the late 70s and then through the 80s, uh, you have um, New Wave, which is sort of a a broad uh, label, and then you would have sort of subsets of new wave, music called ska, music called mod, um, and then these are some of the many bands that we could put in this broad category, Devo, The Flock of Seagulls, Big Country, 
English B B-52s, and there are many, many others that could fit into this general category. And then, of course, at the same time, you have the punk music, uh, the advent of punk music, also starting in the, in the 70s, but in the 80s, it certainly a, a regional punk scene flowers in Southern California, of course, in, in New York and other places as well. These would be some of the, some of the better known uh, punk bands of the time. And so these are things that are happening in popular culture. Something else that's going on is a concern about the end of the world. And sometimes this, um, this was informed by religious ideas uh, about you know, the apocalypse and, and the end of the world because God was going to bring history to an end. In other cases, this concern would be expressed in terms of worry about nuclear war. In other cases, it's expressed in terms of uh, concerns about overpopulation. Um, and so the way people talked about sort of the unraveling of planet Earth, the end of the world, the way they would talk about it could be different, but there was a common theme uh, that, that seemed to have some prominence in the 80s, and that was concern about the end of the world. And it was just kind of a, kind of a cultural, um, sort of a cultural thing, a, a set of ideas floating around in the culture. One thing that is, I think, unique to evangelical churches probably was concern about uh, Satanism, concern about evil in the popular culture. There was a, a book that, was, uh, that came out in the early 70s called The Satan Seller. There was concern about something called backward masking, that if you played vinyl albums backwards, uh, sometimes you would hear satanic messages and... Uh, I remember going, you know, going to seminars on, on this kind of thing. Whether there's anything to that or not, I have no opinion, but it was definitely a concern among a lot of folks in church. And then there were some bands that, that took advantage of this, that certainly fed into this idea, um, and then I think took advantage of it. Uh, you could think of Black, of Black Sabbath, of Alice Cooper, ACDC, Kiss, and other bands who promoted this fear uh, and who sort of took advantage of this fear. This is a way to be provocative in the popular culture. Um, linked to the political turn that we mentioned a few minutes ago, among evangelicals as well, there is a politically conscious uh, movement that grows up, um, I think begins in the 70s, but, you know, sort of... Uh, flowers in the 80s. The term religious right is, is often used. And um, this is an important movement. And so all of these things we're discussing are, are in the background. I think they help to explain what happened in Southern California with the alternative Christian, Christian music scene. And then also among evangelicals, there is the development of a sophisticated nar narrative to counter Darwinian evolution. Folks who are committed to you know, the, the proposition that the world is 6,000, 8,000, maybe 10,000 years old. And, uh, you know, these folks challenge uh, the idea of Darwinian evolution, and they offer, you know, lengthy and sophisticated articles and books. So what we're talking about are some things that are happening in the general culture, concern about the end of the world, um, bands that certainly you know, whether they're serious or not, um, convey a sense of being associated with evil. Um, and then among evangelicals themselves, um, you have a greater political consciousness associated with political conservatism, and then you also have a, a movement that challenges Darwinian evolution. And so within the population generally, you have an evangelical uh, subculture that is more activist and uh, more interested in being involved in the public culture and in having an influence on the public culture. So just to review some of the things we've, we've noticed, it's a period at least at the presidential level of political conservatism. We have this new style of, new st we have these new styles of music, new wave and punk. There's a general concern about the end of time, not that everybody's preoccupied with this all of the time, 
but it's just kind of an idea that's floating around and, and gains prominence at certain moments in the 80s, thinking about the problems of overpopulation, if that really is a problem, the possibility of nuclear war, the possibility of God bringing about the end of the world. There's a concern, I think especially in churches, about evil in popular culture as expressed in some of these bands that seem to celebrate evil, whether that was just a, a marketing shtick or not is a different question, but that's what it looked like to parents, that they were celebrating evil. And then there's the development of a politically aware, distinct evangelical identity. Let's come to Southern California itself. And I think we really need to focus on a particular county, Orange County, in Southern California. And just as the country itself um, takes a conservative turn, at least in presidential politics in the 1980s, well, Orange County, as I notice here on the screen, was conservative before conservative was cool. If you look at the map there, uh, where uh, John F. Kennedy beats the Republican conservative candidate in 1964 pretty handily in the state of California, but you notice I have in the box there Orange County, which went for Goldwater. On the other, the other map, it's, it's very hard to see. Um, you can see that California in, in that election goes overwhelmingly for the conservative candidate, uh, Ronald Reagan, and it's difficult to see, but Orange County uh, went for Reagan even more than the rest of the state. So Orange County politically at this time uh, in the 1980s and before was a politically conservative county. Uh, you can see it again, I have it there in the box. Uh, uh, the box that the, um, in, that, in that white box that President Bush, um, who does not win this election, but you can see Orange County uh, votes for President Bush in the, in the 1992 election. So it's a pretty conservative county. Now among the cities that we most associate with undercover, this one band that I'm focusing on, the cities we most associate with them in Southern California, Fullerton, Costa Mesa, and Yorba Linda, all three of these are in Orange County. Also Huntington Beach and Newport Beach are in Orange County. And Orange County, as we've noted, was politically conservative. But I think very, it's very important to notice, though, that Orange County was also cool. So Orange County is conservative, but it's also cool. And it's also fun, because Orange County is where Disneyland is. Orange County is where another amusement park called Knott's Berry Farm is. Orange County is where Huntington Beach is. Orange County is where Newport Beach is. These photos here are of a particular place called The Wedge. Uh, there at Balboa Beach uh, down the coast a bit from Newport. And uh, so I think that, that this is important to notice that Orange County is conservative, but it's not sort of rural America conservative. It's, it's conservative, but it's also cool. Um, the skateboarding culture, which we see all around us these days still, skateboarding is everywhere, begins in Southern California and it emerges from the surf culture of Southern California. And Skateboarder Magazine began to be published in 1964 in the city of Dana Point, and Dana Point is in Orange County. And so this, you know, this activity that we associate with youth and a certain kind of coolness comes from Orange County, or at least is very much associated with Orange County. Also in Orange County, we have a very strong evangelical presence. And you have some text there that you can look at which just notes that, that um, there were in the 1980s a lot of very big churches in California. Some of these were in Southern California. And one of these very big churches in Southern California in Orange County was Calvary Chapel, which is a church, but it's also, it's a church that has many uh, plants uh, so Calvary Chapel becomes a movement, and then there are many Calvary Chapel churches in many different places. But Calvary Chapel is more than a church. It's, as I indicated, it's a movement. And Calvary Chapel comes to be associated not just with churches, but with concerts and with all sorts of activities. And if the main church is in Orange County, then that means it's in a place that's conservative, but it's also cool. So here we have an, an, an evangelical 
you know, church, uh, which is big, which is not far from Newport Beach, which is not far from Huntington Beach. And um, so it's conservative politically, culturally, theologically, but it's also in a context of cool. And I think that that's, that's pretty important to notice. There's a magazine called Tempor Contemporary Christian, uh, Contemporary Christian Music, and published at the time in Orange County. And so Orange County is very, very important here. Now there is background that in the 60s and, and, and early 70s, there was a movement called the Jesus Movement, sort of um, a Christian hippie movement, we might say. And uh, I won't say anything about the, about the, the folks we're looking at on the, on the screen here, but uh, Randy Stonehill, Larry Norman, Keith Green, a band called Love Song, these were important, uh, important musicians associated with this earlier Christian movement, um, which was national, but had a very strong presence in Southern California. So we've said it's associated with Calvary Chapel. And one of the interesting things about Calvary Chapel is that it was uh, conservative politically, uh, culturally, theologically, and yet open um, and seemingly not very uptight. And so you have baptismal services held at the beach. This is um, at a location uh, in Balboa Harbor, uh, close to Balboa Beach, close to another beach called Corona del Mar. And um, it's certainly not a stuffy baptismal service. It's a fun baptismal service. You see you've got kids, you've got a, a young woman there in a, in a bikini who's going to be baptized. Um, and so you have baptismal services unlike any baptismal service you've seen before. It's celebratory, it's fun, it's cool, and it's happening in Orange County, this place that's conservative but, but cool. And an important name we associate with this is Chuck Smith, who is the lead pastor of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and a, a very important uh, cultural figure, especially in Orange County, who died in 2013. And he had a national presence through his books and through his radio program. So as we've said, Calvary Chapel um, was conservative, but in important ways it was culturally open and innovative. And you see the, the photo there of Chuck Smith before uh, a Calvary Chapel group, and there they are uh, at Balboa Harbor uh, there in Orange County. And so this uh, excerpt is drawn from an article um, just about the history of, of uh, the band Undercover. And it says in 1982 that Pastor Chuck uh, took the liberty of introducing this band Undercover to an unsuspecting audience. The band goes on to record its debut album the same year, 1982, and the world has never been the same. And then you'll notice in the excerpt below, there's a reference to California Christian youth culture. And so there was something going on in Southern California that was sort of centered in Orange County that led to what I think is, is a very interesting musical movement, this alternative uh, Christian music movement, which is still, of course, exists. You can hear it on, on Christian music stations around the country. But for those of us who were there and for those of us who sort of participated you know, on the ground, um, this was a very uh, unique um, and inspiring and interesting and fun time. And um, a lot of us look back with certain nostalgia on those, on those years. One of the things that made it possible to see these bands, of course, we, we could go to many places to see Undercover. You could go to schools. They played in schools. They played in parks. They played in festivals. They played in churches. But they would also play um, at uh, entertainment venues like Disneyland, like Knott's Berry Farm. And there were special evenings where you could go to Disneyland, for example, and you could see 10 of these bands play. Or you could go to Knott's and see 10 of these bands play. You could go to Magic Mountain, a Six Flag theme park uh, not far away, and see many of these bands. And so there were a lot of opportunities to see these bands. And I think that's, that's worth noting, because remember what I said about MTV. Uh, come the, uh, come the, er the early 1980s, 
there's a desire to actually see the bands that you like a lot. And in Southern California, uh, for kids in evangelical churches, this was possible. It was, if you wanted to, you could go see Undercover probably a, a, a couple times a month, a few times a month, and you wouldn't have to drive very far. And more often than, than not, it was free. And so it was very easy to, to see these bands. Um, and that becomes kind of a response to the MTV culture that we have, we kids, we young people in the evangelical churches, we have a music scene of our own that's pretty cool and it doesn't cost us a lot other than gas and time that it takes to get to the shows. The shows are good and, uh, and so the movement goes. And so generally speaking, I think among evangelicals, uh, you have a sense of anxiety that the country is being lost, even though through the 80s, through most of the 80s, uh, yeah, I mean, actually through the entire decade of the 80s, the president is a Republican, the president is conservative. Despite that, there's a feeling that the culture itself is not conservative. And so there's a concern that the country culturally is being lost. Increasingly, evangelicals feel alienated from the popular culture, certainly, and more and more from government, even though the president himself, Reagan, and then uh, George H.W. Bush, even though they are conservative Republicans, there's a growing feeling of alienation from government. There's a desire among a lot of evangelicals to influence society. And so in Orange County, you have an ins infrastructure that's in place. You have large churches, you have the Calvary Chapel movement, you have a lot of wealth. Uh, Orange County is a wealthy place. Orange County is also a cool place. And so if we're going to influence our culture, if we're going to influence our society through music, then this would be one place where evangelicals would be able to do this. And so there's a demand for something that's conservative and culturally relevant, for something that's cool but also, you know, safe. So, you know, if parents, you know, if parents in a Christian church uh, or evangelical parents, if they know that their, their kid is going to see Alice Cooper, they might be pretty concerned about that. If they know that they're going to see the altar boys or the choir or Adam again or undercover, uh, they probably uh, feel a lot better than that. And then uh, they feel a lot better about that. And then there's, uh, there's a demand for ease of access, right? Remember, MTV is easy. You can, you can see, if you like Devo, you can see Devo videos all the time. If you like the Flock of Seagulls, you can see Flock of Seagulls videos all the time. If you like Undercover, you can go see Undercover a lot. If you like the choir, you can go see them a lot. There's a desire for something that's familiar and that's safe, but also that's new. And even if it feels a little bit radical, uh, that's okay, so long as it's not scary. So conservative and cool, right? This is, this is what we're after, something that's kind of conservative and cool. And so this band Undercover, I think, fits the bill. Uh, undercover was conservative, meaning that they don't say things in their lyrics that will be overtly offensive to, you know, to most parents. Some parents will, you know, who are a little uptight may, may feel that, you know, some of the lyrics push certain boundaries, but nothing like what's in the culture outside of the churches. Undercover was conservative, but seemed radical and I'll illustrate what I mean by that in a second. Undercover was cool, but not offensive, at least to the young people. Of course, older folks might not like their haircuts and might not like the way they dressed and might not like their music style, but to young folks, they seemed cool and, and not particularly scary. And then uh, for a while there, it seemed like Undercover was just playing constantly and you could see them, you know, just personally, I, just how many times I saw them in concert, I, I wouldn't be able to count, but in many, many different locations, in many, many different contexts. And I think that this is sort of an answer to the ease of MTV. For evangelical kids, we have our own, our own world. We have our own bands. We have our own uh, subculture. And, uh, and we can see our bands a lot. Um, to kind of get to the sense of, you know, undercover as a, as a radical 
group, a conservative but radical. If you look at one part of the poster, it says the world has no answer, Christ is the answer. Boys and girls renounce the world. Well, that sounds very, you know, very traditional on the one hand, but it also sounds kind of radical. And uh, I won't try to argue that point, but I, I hope you just see what I mean. On the one hand, it sounds very conservative, you know, the, a traditional Christian idea, this world is not our home. Um, but the way, it's, the way it's expressed sounds something, you know, sounds a bit radical. The battle cry is spreading. You know, there's sort of a, a cultural, spiritual war going on. And then you look at the excerpt, it says, California's most talked about band breaks out with a vengeance, delivering a message of hope and renewal. Well, that sounds good. Framed in apocalyptic visions. Remember the, this concern that I mentioned a bit, a, a bit back about, you know, the end of the world and, and the, is the world coming to an end? And that theme actually shows up in, in a couple of undercover songs. So on the one hand, the band is about hope and renewal. On the other hand, there's, there are apocalyptic visions, right? Uh, there are guitars that are slashing and riveting, etc. And so it's a vision of truth, uncompromising and unyielding, yet sensitive, devoted, and assured. And uh, as far as marketing goes, I think that this is brilliant. Whoever wrote this is brilliant because I think that they understood that, you know, if we want to attract these church kids, just speaking of it purely in a marketing sense, if you want to attract these church kids and if we want the church kids' parents to be okay with this, then, you know, the parents need to know, look, we're, we're on track. You know, we're not going to lead your children, you know, uh, you know, down some dangerous path. At the same time, if we want to appeal to the kids, then, you know, then we want this to be a little edgy, a little radical, and uh, I think that this marketing is, is brilliant. It, it, pulls it, off, it pulls it off really well. And just speaking from personal experience, I mean, it worked. Because you go to an undercover concert, and not only did you see a great show, uh, not only did you feel that your basic spiritual ideas were confirmed, but you also felt like you'd participated in something that was cutting edge, uh, that was fresh, that had a, a radical kind of feel to it. And so, just to kind of rehearse some of the points again, uh, there's a, a music market demand in, in Southern California. Anyway, at least in the world that I was part of. We want something that's conservative, culturally relevant, cool, and safe. We want something that's easy to access. And I think Undercover met those demands. There are a lot of bands. I was in one of them myself, uh, fairly short-lived. Uh, there are a lot of these bands that, that came out, but I think most people familiar with that scene would, would recognize, would agree, that Undercover was certainly one of the most important bands, if not the most important band. And so what made Undercover special? Well, one thing you have to say is that they just put on really great shows. Um, you know, I mean, one of the best concerts I ever saw, and I've seen a lot of concerts, but one of the best concerts I ever saw was an Undercover show. And I remember a lot of undercover shows. And so that's important. You know, if you want to hold people's attention as a band, putting on a good show is, is, a, is a real help. And undercover did that. And you can read the excerpt uh, that I've posted there. But this is one thing that obviously accounts for it. They put on, that accounts for undercover success is they, they put on a good show. Something else is, and I don't know if this was intentional or not, but undercover um, had a number of songs that got the crowd involved and uh, the crowd wouldn't need to be told to be involved and I won't try to explain it uh, explain this to you those of you who who grew up in that world and went to these concerts will will know what I'm talking about but there were certain lyrics in some of undercover songs that just naturally led to uh, audience participation and so if you go to an undercover show and you know the songs and it's one of these scenes where, you know, like the, the crowd in front of the stage, like the one you see here, almost everybody knows every word to every song, and so you've got everybody singing along. And then these certain songs uh, come along um, that just create audience participation. And um, in terms of the success of the band and the sense that, you know, that was a great show, you feel that you weren't just a spectator, but you were a participant. Whether Undercover did that, you know, th rather thought that through about how can we get the audiences involved, 
I don't know, but um, whether they did that intentionally or not, that's what happened, and, and it was successful. So you have great shows, you have songs that you know just sort of create audience participation, and then very uniquely, undercover shows also appealed to the mind. The sort of the the front man of undercover, uh, Joe Taylor, Joey Taylor, O Joe Taylor, as we called him then, was and still is a very thoughtful, uh, very intelligent, and very individualistic guy. And so Joe, he would, he would share messages that were conservative, meaning that they were identifiably Christian and, and rooted in the Bible, but he always did so in an original way. Um, and you always felt challenged when Joe spoke, and I think, you know, this, is, this is, was very, very unusual that you'll have uh, a concert where kids are you know really into the music and doing the you know getting involved when the when the time to get involved comes really and just enjoying the show then that song will end and Joe will start talking and then the crowd just gets quiet and it's not just okay we're getting quiet because we're polite because this guy's talking the crowd got quiet because there was something riveting about what was being said and you knew that you were hearing from a unique person who wasn't just you know, talking because he felt like he had to talk in this particular venue, but was talking about whatever happened to be on his mind. And so I've, I've given a quote here. Imagine young people. This is from a letter that was written about, about Joe. Uh, imagine young people who minutes before had been singing along with a band and now standing in rapt attention as Joe Taylor or Ojo, as we called him then, spoke about whatever happened to be on his mind. It was extraordinary, and it marked me and many of my friends, and, and that's true. And this is something that folks who went to undercover concerts, that they still remember. So it's a very unusual, it's a very unusual uh, event. Um, and then Joe would stop talking, and then the next song would kick in, and you know the audience would shift again uh, to going back to enjoying the show. And just other examples of uh, how Joe Taylor or Ojo was not only a musician, but was a person who appealed to the mind for a good while there in the 1980s. Uh, and then I think going into the early 90s as well, he published uh, a column in a, a newspaper associated with the alternative Christian music scene. And uh, I remember you know, always reading these columns and once again just being impressed by how Joe, on the one hand, was very much part of that evangelical world, but was always, you could tell, he just thought about things in original ways and was something of a provocateur. I think that's, uh, that's his personality. Um, certainly very much an individualist, and uh, that, was, that was appealing at the time. Something else is that, uh, that I think helped to explain Undercover's success uh, at this time was they put on great shows, their songs got people involved, so that appeals to the body. There's the appeal to the mind, which I just discussed, and then there's, there's the appeal to the soul. And just the, the simple fact that a lot of people uh, came out of undercover concerts, different people. Their thinking about spiritual questions changed. And, and I know, I know, uh, there's one person I know uh, very well Who's, who made a significant change in her life as a result of uh, things that were said at an undercover concert. So this is, this is you know, sort of a, a, an, interesting, an interesting world that, that young people in Southern California who participated in the subculture, it's an interesting world that they're in, where the concerts are great, it's a great band, talented, original, a lot of Undercover's music, I think, still stands the test of time. Um, but you don't walk away from the concert only feeling like that was a great show, which it always was, but you walk away from the concert feeling like you had also been challenged to think. And sometimes that led actually to people you know, making important decisions about their life. And then, so, of course, uh, something else that we would say is uh, the memories that are created. And I think it's often the case, you get into your 40s, your 50s, 
and you look back and, and you realize how certain songs, how certain bands were very important to you. And of all the things that are on the internet from Undercover, this is the, the video uh, that I most treasure because part of this video uh, is from a concert that was held in Redlands, California in 1990. And uh, it was held at a place called the Redlands Bowl in Redlands, California, 1990 Rock of Love Festival. And it's a great memory, not only because it was a great show, uh, I was there, and so I remember that show. Uh, it's a great memory for me because that's where I met my wife. And uh, so, um, you know, even now as I, as I think about it, just um, what an interesting time that was in Southern California uh, to be involved in, the, in that evangelical subculture, in a lot of ways to be, you know, very conservative and yet to participate in this movement that seemed cool, cutting edge, uh, the music from a lot of these bands, uh, the choir, Adam again, undercover, the music from these bands was good. A lot of it has stood the test of time. And uh, then they're just, so they're just the great memories that come along with, with being part of that. And uh, there in the box there, I, I, I think I found myself because uh, I was there in the crowd. And so I went through and looked and I think I think that that's me there that I've boxed off. Anyway, I'll end this here, and, and, uh, and uh, who knows, maybe there are others out there who grew up in Southern, Southern California in the 80s and uh, who also remember this subculture. So I offer these thoughts to you, and I'll be interested to know what you think. Take care. Bye.